out. Big showdown in Spokane between San Diego State and Gonzaga, the only Western programs to reach a Final Four since UCLA in 2006. I think I have that right. Jim Meehan, Spokesman Review, does a great job covering the Zags beat for the Spokesman Review. Joining us right now is San Diego Sports 760. Again, you can hear tomorrow's game from the kennel right here, 6 o'clock Pacific, pregame coverage at 530 with Ted Leitner on the call. So, Jim, we appreciate your time here in San Diego. I I've been saying today, and I'm curious if you agree with me or not, it feels like maybe even a bigger one for Gonzaga than San Diego State because the Aztecs in the Mountain West are going to have opportunities with the schedule they're going to play. I don't know if the same can be said for Gonzaga without BYU in the league. Would you agree this is just a, a pivotal one for Gonzaga tomorrow night? No, I think you're right on. I uh, just got through writing that, in fact, oh. in the uh, preview of the game because the Zags, you know, they're, I don't think it was that way when they signed up for this and their schedule came out because the Zags were playing in Maui. Uh, well, I guess a move to Honolulu, the Maui Invitational, yeah. and there was a chance they could play three top five teams, top ten teams, and they ended up only playing one. And that, along with the loss to UConn in, in Seattle, has kind of taken, uh, you know, the, some of the luster off their non-conference schedule. And they just don't have many opportunities left. And as you mentioned, the WCC has, I think, two other teams in the top 60 in the net, St. Mary's and San Francisco. And, you know, San Diego State will have a pretty steady diet of teams in the top 40 in the net. I think there's five or six. So, this is one of the last chances for Gonzaga. They do have one in February, kind of a uh, in-conference, uh, non-conference affair. They're playing Kentucky in yeah. Lexington. But by that time of the year, uh, Kentucky, with all those young kids going through a, the first round of the SEC, that might be a tough matchup for Gonzaga. Jim Meehan is with us right now. He covers Gonzaga for the Spokesman Review. So, you know, to go further there, I mean, what do you feel as if you know about Gonzaga at this point without any quad one win, still a solid record, still a top 15 team in the AP? What have you learned about this iteration of the Zags? Well, they're they're a little bit different than the teams in the, that have kind of, uh, you know, crashed the national landscape here. They This team, not quite as, uh, as strong offensively. The numbers are still good. They're averaging about 84 points a game, but they just have not shot the ball very well. They're shooting 32% from distance, and that would be the lowest in Mark Few's coaching time at hmm. Gonzaga, 25 years. Now they do have, uh, I think they have the pieces. I don't think they're as bad a shooting team as they've shown so far, but you know the numbers are what they are. Uh, they, they have a pretty good rotation of four guys inside. Graham E.K., who San Diego sure. State saw quite a bit when he was at Wyoming. Uh, Braden Huff off the bench. Ben Gregg off the bench. And then just kind of a do-everything steady guy and Anton Watson that's had some big games for him, a uh, fifth-year senior. Uh, backcourt is, is much thinner than past Gonzaga teams. They play two guys primarily. Uh, Ryan Nemhart, a transfer from Creighton, and Nolan Hickman, who was the point guard last year, kind of moved to the uh, off guard spot. Now those guys will play against top teams. They're, they've been out there 38, 39, 40 minutes. So uh, that's one area of concern for the Zags. They're a little better defensively than maybe some of their past teams have been, uh, but but just not quite as as uh, uh, fluid and and productive offensively. What's getting a lot of discussion down here that I would imagine isn't really being discussed up there because it didn't involve Gonzaga is what happened at the end of the Elite Eight this past year. Darion Trammell fouled by Ryan Nemhard. Now he was at Creighton. This has been, you know, one of the, it would have been one of the bigger moments in San Diego sports history, if not for Lamont Butler in the next game, you know, hitting the buzzer beater against FAU. Has there been any talk now, I know they ran into each other this summer because the Mountain West and the WCC had their media day in the same venue in Las Vegas. I think San Diego State and Creighton have a lot of respect for each other. They played a lot recently. Um, and I'm sure Nemhard and Trammell do as well. But is, is that a story within a game what happened last year in the Elite Eight with Trammell getting fouled by Nemhard in the waning seconds? You know, I, I think uh, we asked uh, Nemhard about it mm -hmm. down at those media days with, with both teams. Uh, 
uh, San Diego State and, and Gonzaga, the conference media days, were together down there in Vegas. And he did talk about it. Um, uh, he, you know, I think he was uh, uh, not sold that it was a foul. Hmm. I'm sure it's a different opinion from the San Diego State kid, but I think that was in the closing seconds. Yeah, of about game. two seconds, one second, somewhere in there. Yeah, and uh, you know, it was kind of one of those that, uh, if I remember right, it's kind of a fifty-fifty call. Maybe you don't see that at the end of a game that's tied very often, and they let them go to overtime, but they called it and. And uh, the kid hit the free throw to win it. I, I, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, Ryan, uh, the, the thing I remember about that game is Ryan hurting his wrist. Right. And I asked Dutcher about it down at the media days. And, and that's the first thing he said was that that was a game changing deal. If, if he had stayed healthy and been healthy, uh, he was having a great tournament. He, uh, I think he had a game of 32 points. Uh, was really kind of uh, carrying a team that had real a chance to get to the to the title game. I thought the way they were playing, and uh, but he hurt his wrist. He did say that that was bothering him uh, quite a bit. Didn't use it as, as an excuse. Most competitors don't, but uh, that's what Dutcher remembered about the game, and and I'm sure Ryan hasn't forgot that call either. So uh, that that connection, and then the Graham Ek connection from Wyoming. I don't think Graham's teams beat. San Diego State in four tries. So a couple of things we'll, we'll remember uh, San Diego State for sure. Yeah, and one additional connection within there, Jim Meehan, spokesman reviewers with us, is if you go back an additional year, Nemhart's freshman year, San Diego State had him dead to rights in the first round of the NCAA tournament, and Creighton came all the way back in the waning seconds to tie it, get the game to overtime. Kalkbrenner gets hurt in overtime. Creighton beats San Diego State. I think they came back from maybe seven or eight down with two or three minutes to play against the Aztecs. So a lot of familiarity is my point with Nemhart and San Diego State. All right, Jim, here's a question for you. I mean, I don't know if you, again, you cover the Zags, but you know, you you followed West Coast basketball and you've seen the Zags play San Diego State a good amount over the last 15 years. There's been, you know, three or four games. How do you look at what Gonzaga has carved out over the last 25 years under Mark Few to what Steve Fisher and Brian Dutcher have done in San Diego? Well, there's a lot of parallels there. They, they are both, uh, you know, teams that have kind of ruled their conferences. Uh, Gonzaga has uh, won it or shared it pretty much every year, but one or two under Mark Few, the West Coast Conference. And I think San Diego State, I was reading their release, is easily the most titles uh, with this uh, uh, this uh, iteration of the Mountain West. They're always in the tournament, it seems like, and then breaking through to get to the title game. You know, the Zags did that in 17 and 21. Uh, they went to the title games and lost, and and, uh, and San Diego State broke through and did it last year. So uh, I think that's the, the parallels are that the Zags have, have got a uh, stability in the coaching staff, kind of their methods, philosophy, and, and systems, uh, usually more offensive-minded than defensive-minded, but that 17 team was probably better on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, and San Diego State has done it with the same thing. I mean, Dutcher was there forever as an assistant, got promoted. Mark Few did the same thing. Uh, he runs, a, a, I mean, that program's cornerstones. You guys know better than me, but it seems like defense and rebounding is, yep. is about 85% of every win they post. So uh, they're, they're, uh, they, they've got their systems. There's, they've got their niches, and, and they have, uh, have kind of dominated their – not only their conferences, but I mean, there's, you know, it, maybe with Arizona, I would say Oregon at times, UCLA at times. I mean, they've been kind of the West Coast con- uh, powers of both programs. So I, I, and and neither one of them duck anybody. They they like playing teams that are the best teams from across the country in the non-conference. So I think there's a lot of parallels there and a lot of mutual respect. Uh, of how they've gone about it and how they've done it over you know a decade or two. They're not just flash in the pan. Yeah, I, I think it's well said. I mean, I, I don't know if most teams coming off a national championship game appearance would play you know, San Diego State on the road in the non-conference, Gonzaga, BYU, Grand Canyon, UCSD across town just to fulfill a contract. I think there's a lot of programs around the country that would try to get out of some of those games. Jim Meehan, spokesman review, is with us right now on John and Jim. 
How's it being received in Spokane and maybe with Gonzaga as well? What's happened here with Oregon State and Washington State and what's going to transpire over the next couple of years with them playing in the WCC? Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Gonzaga, well, Mark was asked, Mark Few was asked about it after their last game. And it had happened maybe an hour or two before that game tipped off. So he said he hadn't had a chance to look at it. Um, you know, I, I take him at his word. That's probably true. And so he didn't really have an opinion. Uh, I think from the conference perspective, you know, to add those two programs, both well-known, both have had some uh, success in the uh, basketball arena. I mean, the Cougars, it's been a while since they played in the tournament, but Kyle Smith, he was in the WCC at, uh, at, at San Francisco, did a nice job there, and he's doing a nice job at Washington State. So that program actually has a higher net rating than Gonzaga. I think they're 44th. Zags are 45. And then Oregon State had that uh, kind of uh, a run to the lead eight what was that three four years ago yeah <laughs> the elite eight uh, have fallen since but uh you know a program that's uh, that's done its fair share of winning too so i think from the conference perspective it it kind of fortifies things uh byu left to go to the big 12 this year uh gonzaga has talked with the big 12 it seems like for almost 14 15 months so there's mm. obviously interest there so the conference adds those two programs. It probably kind of fortifies their roster, whether Gonzaga, if they ever got an invite to the Big 12, if they left or not, uh, that would keep them at, I think they're at 11 now with the Zags. So, um, you know, I don't think Gonzaga is, uh, you know, against the, the additions by any means. I think it's probably a smart move on the conference's part. And uh, I think with all the changes of rosters and conferences, it's hard to keep up these days. But uh, I think it uh, probably brings some st- stability to the WCC. Final one, Jim, before you go, what does what tomorrow night come down to? Maybe from Gonzaga's perspective, I mean, what's it going to come down to? Should be a competitive, close game. Uh, what, what do you expect to be the difference tomorrow night? Oh, I th- yeah, I think it's going to be a, a physical battle. I, I think number one is probably – you know, who kind of imposes their will or their style of play on, on the other. And I think San Diego State would probably like to keep it in the 60s or 70s. The Zags would like to get up and down a little more. Uh, and then I think uh, whoever might be able to knock down a three-point shot. I don't think either team has shot it very well in, uh, in the first 10, 12 games of the year. So if somebody can get that percentage into the 40s or 50s, uh, compared to what they're doing in the low 30s. I think that team could probably come out ahead, but I, I think it's going to be just kind of a physical knockdown drag out. That's what the other ones have been when they played. I, I can remember watching Kawhi Leonard mm. and, and the Aztecs beat GU in, in, the, uh, in the McCarthy Athletic Center. So I think it's going to be close, and uh, maybe the team that can find that three-point stroke gets it done. First of two in a home-and-home series with the Zags coming to Viejas next year. First meeting since 2017, a one-point win for San Diego State at Viejas. I think all time, the series is tied at two. It's been a good, relatively short series between a couple of West Coast powers. Jim Meehan, Spokesman Review. Jim, we're looking forward to tomorrow night. Thanks for hopping on. Yeah, no problem. Enjoyed it.